Hi all, welcome to Tree Talk. I'm Jamie Dahl with Central State University Extension and the McIntyre Stennis Program and with me is... Dave Absalom, I'm with Ohio State University Extension. And today we are going to be talking about tree identification um, and we're breaking this into some segments today. So we're going to do um, a short piece on what's happening in the woods right now, um, some basics of tree identification. Uh, we're going to talk about a featured tree which is going to be the maples today and then we're going to promote some opportunities coming up to learn more about um, some of these topics. So Jamie, what's happening in the woods? Thanks, Dave. Yeah, so um, so a beautiful time here, um, May in the woods, and um, some of what we have going on is things are flowering, and some things have recently flowered. Uh, so you can see here we have some images. Uh, so so two that kind of are just coming off flowering. Um, many people probably noticed the red buds out there uh, along the highways, that really bright pink. Um, and of course, uh, I was out doing some turkey hunting, and I caught some that were kind of right between that had some flowers and some of the leaf out. I'd say now those are all pretty well leafed out. Uh, there's a dogwood there. There's still some dogwoods I noticed kind of lingering in the woods with the flowers. That's those beautiful white flowers. And then um, also the there were some aspen, some big tooth aspen that were kind of just starting to have the leaves come out about a week ago. Um, and so this is kind of a reminder of, well, what's happening behind this? This is the bud burst and basically uh, all those little leaves that we're ready in those buds as the sap starts to flow uh, and we get um, we get those those showy leaves coming out and things are really greening up um, there's some other things going on in the woods too we have um, some beautiful wildflowers uh, and I certainly personally I'm still learning a lot of my wildflowers but just on a, a brief walk um, on some public lands recently uh, some of the flowers that I, we saw that don't know why that advanced. The darker purple one um, is um, the uh, dwarf larkspur, dwarf larkspur. Um, then we had a may apple, which has the flower is really kind of just hidden beneath um, that that big kind of umbrella-like leaf. Uh, and then we had um, the fire pink, which actually is pretty red, and that one really, really stood out, uh, and the wild geranium. So kind of a fun time to be looking, and uh, Division of Wildlife has a really nice publication on some of the most common uh, wildflowers that you see in Ohio. And then, I don't know, Dave, why don't you share a little bit, because this was right yeah. from your property on these So morels. yeah, it's, we're just finishing up the morel season. Uh, it was very short, but we actually had a really good morel season. Uh, most of these pictures are from this year, um, and uh, I'm not sure what's happening. Yeah, we're getting some advancing. automatic advancing going. But the morels are always fun. They're real tasty. Um, the big thing on the morels and the mushrooms is make sure you know which ones, which ones are which. But I grew up hunting morels. Uh, that's a picture of my son probably eating or 10 years ago we had a uh, a nice find so and then the omelet that we made on Sunday which was pretty darn good awesome yeah so um, so yeah we've been hearing from folks that there's there were pretty good season for some morels in been. some places uh, and then um, of course the forest providing other foods as well um, there's actually it's gobbler season and something else you might be hearing out there in the woods is those male turkeys um, male turkeys calling at the mating time um, and that's actually um, we our family was fortunate to have a, a turkey harvested and it was pretty tasty um, and then that's a good reminder that there are some edibles from the forest such as um, the morels that Dave was talking about and we have a program coming up on Friday May 10th where we're gonna um, cover that at the a day in the woods um, 
And then we did, we thought it's also appropriate to mention a less fun thing that's happening right now in the woods, but the ticks are waking up. Um, and so as we're out in the woods, we're already having to check for ticks. Uh, and so if, if folks aren't aware, um, you really want to be on the lookout for those, those ticks. And when you come out of the woods, um, we have, there's dog tick, lone star tick, and black legged are some of the types that we see in Ohio. And you want to check your clothes. And the best recommendation is actually to throw those clothes right in the dryer immediately from coming in and that will actually kill the ticks um, so so uh, stay tuned for more information on yeah. ticks we're hoping to do a program in one of our upcoming episodes on ticks and today we're going to do a little review on the basics of tree ID so for the first slide, um, we're pretty excited. We worked uh, collaboratively with Division of Wildlife and Division of Forestry to help put together this new tree ID guide. Um, so we're excited that it's out there and available through Division of Wildlife. Um, just another shot of the back of that cover of that new publication. And then this is a publication that we use quite often to just review some of the basics and teach some of the basics of tree ID. It's a bulletin that we've produced through Ohio State University Extension. So what I first want to do is review a little bit about leaf arrangement. And that's how the leaves are attached to the twig. That's where the buds are. And then it also is, uh, determines the branching down the road. So, um, this is again another example of what's in the book. Today we're going to focus in on the trees that are opposite and by opposite we mean um, the one in the middle. The leaves are paired up on one side of the twig. You're going to have a bud and a leaf and then you'll have the same thing on the opposite side so they're kind of paired up. And then we'll com contrast that a little bit with those that are alternate which is the most common type of tree that we're going to see out there. Um, we'll get a little bit into leaf shapes um, to, and then we'll talk a little bit about the types of leaves that are out there. Um, but really when it comes to the opposite leaf arrangement, you've got to remember the mad buck. Um, for those of us that work for and are uh, Buckeye fans, mad buck is a great way to remember the trees that have paired or opposite leaf arrangement are the maples, the ash, the dogwoods, and the Buckeyes. And we are excited to have another uh, short segment of tree talk today, and we are going to dig into uh, our maple trees. Uh, and so with that, I have uh, some questions for Dave about these maples. So one, Dave, is can you tell us about um, kind of maples as a whole and just what are some of the key characteristics to know that we're looking at a maple tree? So the maples are pretty common in Ohio. We've got several, um, and we'll talk about each one of the more common ones in Ohio. Um, <clears throat> most of the maples have what we call simple leaves and I'll grab an example of one of those simple leaves this is one of our maples and we got Sarah to change the camera here um, that's an example of a simple leaf and they are what we call palmately compound so think of the palm of your hands all the veins on those leaves kind of come to one point like the fingers on the palm of your hands another really neat thing about maples is they have these winged fruits called Samara um, they're paired and they're the little helicopters if you throw them up in the air they'll spin down and whirl as they come down. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that maples are normally opposite. So when you have a maple, there's going to be a leaf on one side of the twig and it's going to be paired with a leaf on the other side. And eventually the branching is that way too. So it's opposite branching. So that's a great way to separate our maples from a lot of other species that aren't paired up like that or opposite. Okay. So the opposite <clears throat> branching, really key characteristic, that palmate mm -hmm. leaf, and then the Samaras that we're starting yeah. to so see. So here's a, here's a good example of opposite branching again. If you look here, if I can get it arranged a little bit, those leaves are going to be paired up. Which leaves in my way there? So you got a leaf on this side, and then the other one's paired opposite of it. And then the branching happens that way too. Okay, <clears throat> great. And then aren't there also two pretty common groups of maples? Like, a, sure. I feel like <clears throat> the we talk about a hard maple group and a soft maple group. Can we tell folks a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, so the, the most common hard maple is sugar maple, and it's the one that we make, make the maple syrup out of. Um, that season is pretty well finished up for the year. But probably the easiest way to separate the hard maples from the soft maples, and the hard maples are the best for the sugar maple, 
or the maple syrup production. There's another one called black maple we'll talk about briefly. But if you look at the edge of the leaf, you're going to find fairly long segments, maybe an inch or longer, without any little teeth. So okay. the the hard maples will have these big, large teeth with no fine teeth between them, and that's probably the easiest way to separate them. Okay. So sugar maple is a prime example of a hard maple. You see on the screen the, the fruit on the left. Um, they're paired. They're kind of U-shaped. Those fruit don't form till later in the year. So that's another thing. The hard maples form fruit later in the year towards the fall. The soft yeah. maples are more in the spring. Um, so sugar maple is by far one of our more common hard maples out there. It's very shade tolerant, too. It can grow in very dense shade, and it forms these real deep canopies. So, so that's our sugar maple. And some of these are pretty common uh, street trees that we see as well, right? They are. Um, another maple that's out there that's pretty commonly planted in the street, and if we can get to that camera, is got these really broad, fat, dark leaves. And I got to get it arranged there. This is Norway maple, a non native, but you'll see it in the urban areas quite frequently. Um, and you remember how you separate Norway maple from some of the is other it, maples? There's some pretty um, milky residue when you snap that. Yeah, if leaf you break off. the thing, and we probably can't pick it up, or we might be able to, but you'll get a little milky sap when you break that little stem on the leaf, and it'll produce this little milky sap. So that's Norway maple, the fattest or broadest leaf of all the ones that are out there yeah and though we do see it in urban it's actually not th not that highly recommended for planting um, so might be something to consult yeah. uh, an urban forester or somebody about but um, I know most of our urban forester colleagues wish there wasn't so much Norway maple out there yeah and then there's another one it's urban planting um, it's called black maple and black maple is a lot of people don't really distinguish it from sugar but if you look it's got this real broad and kind of droopy leaf and then it usually at the base a little bit later in the year it'll have these little leaflet structures right at the base of the leaf where it attaches to the twig so that's black maple not nearly as common as, as sugar maple but again if you look at the edge of the leaf you don't have the fine teeth that are along the edges of the leaf okay so and, that's Norway and that one is or that's black right black that's maple. Black maple. Yep. yep and black maple is very um, very similar to sugar maple so they'd be pretty tricky they um, to tell apart mm -hmm. yeah all right, and so are those all the hard maples we have those to are, talk about, Dave? Those are the most common hard maples that we've okay. got out there. Sugar maple, more common in the northeast part of the state. Mm -hmm. We've got it down here, but it tends to be low on the slope and maybe on the northern side of the hill. And you'll see it pretty commonly planted in the landscape, too. Okay. Uh, and then, so how about our other big group, then, these soft maples? Well, the, one of the classics is the red maple. And I'm going to grab a sample of the red maple hiding over here. Um, the, the red maple is fairly common. It typically has three lobes on the leaves. So I didn't mention that was sugar, but normally sugar maple has five. But it has three, and it will turn bright red in the fall. Um, fairly common in the landscape, but it's probably one of the most common trees in the woods in Ohio as well. It grows in the understory, it likes the shade, and then it works its way up into the canopy. So that's red maple, and we'll focus in on that a little bit closer. And what you'll notice on this leaf, and maybe I'm going to cheat and put paper behind this one, you're going to see some really fine teeth around the edge of that leaf. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that separates the red and the other soft maples. Um, the you can see that pretty distinctly on the, the slide when we have it up there yeah. again, too. Yeah, nice. Red maple, again, is one of the soft maples. It produces the little wing fruits, and those wing fruits are pretty much on the tree and falling as we speak. So sure. they're hitting the ground. They're just about done for the year. Should we show? Can we show on fallen, Dave? Do you think we can catch that? I don't that? know if we can do that, but let me put these under there just to compare and contrast. Um, but that's that's the little red maple fruit. The next one we're going to talk about is silver maple, so I'm going to just go ahead and compare those two. Both of those are early spring ones. They'll hit the ground and they'll start sprouting here pretty soon. The hard maples are going to sprout a little bit later in the year. So yeah, so they're getting a head start on the, on the hard maples. Yeah. Yep. The other thing you'll hear about with red maple is that a lot of times in the summer this little stem or petiole will turn red or mm -hmm. pink. So that's another good ID characteristic. Of yeah, sure. They tend to really pop in the landscape um, in the fall. So, all right. So that's that's red maple, and then we're going to grab a silver maple. Grab a maple silver here. maple. And we'll put that up to compare and contrast it. The big difference with silver and red is 
is if you look, um, and I've got them upside down, but that's where it gets its common name is silver maple. Look at the underside of that leaf. It's really whitish or silvery. When the wind's blowing, you're going to see that silver. But the other big difference is when you look at a leaf, they're really deeply cut. Mm -hmm. You've got these lobes and then the gaps between them we call sinuses. And they're the deepest cut of all the maples. Um, silver maple is one that we don't recommend in the landscape. Um, it's native habitat where you're going to see it's along streams. Mm -hmm. It really likes wet areas. It does really well on stream banks. And it's a really important tree there because it holds the stream banks and protects the water. Um, but in your yard, they grow so darn fast, they have really weak wood, and the branches break. So we really don't recommend them in the yard as a yard tree because they often get so large so quickly that they become a hazard to the home and, and such, and, and they're really pretty weak wooded. So really not highly recommended for landscape. If you want to plant them, they can be some quick shade, but you need to have kind of succession planting and have some other, other trees to fill in behind them as they get larger. Right. So that's your silver. So maple. silver. So like those deep sinus is very characteristic and then they're getting these their Samara fruits happening in the spring mm -hmm. so another distinct thing. so you know we, we say the maples have these leaves that have the the palmately they're simple leaves but they're the venation is like the palm of your hand mm -hmm. that's most of them of mm -hmm. course every there's always an exception to every rule so I'm gonna show you another tree that's a little different and it is a maple and I'm not advancing it. Go. It's called box elder and box elder is technically one of the other soft maples. This one got a little wilted, but box elder, when you look at that leaf, it kind of looks like poison ivy a lot of times. It's, has, it's the only maple with a compound leaf, but again, it's got the paired leaves, so there's going to be a leaf on each side, but this whole thing is a leaf, and in this case, it's got three leaflets. With box elder, it can have three to seven. I see a lot of threes, a lot of fives, and occasionally some sevens, mm -hmm. um, but it will produce those winged fruits again, um, as we'll show on the slide there, so it'll have the paired winged fruits that are classic for maple, um, but it's the unusual one. It's kind of a weedy tree. It grows along stream sides and down low. Um, another great ID characteristic is that the twig stays green pretty much year round. So it's green and has these kind of white fuzzy woolly buds. Um, so that's, uh, that's another fairly common tree out there. It's uh, called box elder. And pretty, I feel like that's something you see a lot in, um, in, in town, kind of in any wet areas, it really kind of fills in, fills yeah. in some of those areas. And then in the forest too, kind of in. Yeah, it's in, not a real long lived tree. So any place that's been disturbed recently, mm -hmm. like an edge or a right away edge or something like that, they tend to be in places like that, where you see that, but fairly low down mm -hmm. along streams and fairly wet areas. And it, the twig is a little kind of glossy there, it looks like. Too. Yeah, it, it's yeah. a little glossy, stays green, and then a, again, a white woolly bud. So that's a little bit of basics about our maples. Um, really an important group. We we tend to get accused of kind of being biased against maples because we do so much programming on oak, and maples are sometimes in our way. But in the right spot, they play an important role, um, especially on our moist, low-lying sites. Um, and then, of course, um, Ohio and sugar maple production um, for syrup I think we usually rank fourth or fifth in the country so it's it's a pretty big industry mainly up in the northern part of the state mm -hmm. but uh, nothing better than the maple syrup maple for our pancakes so yeah absolutely so um, so now are we gonna talk about there are some other kind of opposite trees that maybe don't fall into the yeah maple so category. again with the maples they're opposite or paired the leaves and then there are a couple other things that are are opposite too. If you remember Mad Buck, that's probably the best way to remember that. The things that are opposite, you've got maples, ash, dogwoods, and buckeyes. And there's some pretty major differences between those. Maples tend to be simple leaves with one blade that have that palmate leafination. Ash tend to have that compound leaf with lots of leaflets. Mm -hmm. And then the classic buckeye, actually got one down here we can show. The buckeyes will have this palmately compound leaf, and this is a big monster leaf. This is actually a yellow buckeye, but it's a compound leaf that has five to seven leaflets, usually five, and so that's a neat way to separate those. And then the dogwoods are a little bit smaller tree. They usually have a simple leaf, but without the lobing that you get on the maples. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So yeah, good to know the Buckeye if you live in Ohio. Right? It is. Yeah, yeah, we've got to got to be able to identify that Buckeye. And those were those are flowering some right now, aren't they? Some of our yellow Buckeyes. They are the the yellow Buckeye and the Ohio Buckeye are flowering now. And I, there's actually one that's native a little bit further south in, of Ohio called the Red Buckeye, and I've got one of those planted that has a nice flower spike that's got red to it. So they're really pretty as well. Nice. So any, anything else really key you think we need to know about um, our maples in general, Dave? I, I think that pretty well covers it. In general, um, they, they can take a little bit more shade if you want to plant them. Uh, they can be a little hindrance to our uh, management of our oak forest, but they're certainly an important part of it. Um, the other piece is there's some, lots of non-native ones that are planted out there in the landscape, mostly Asian, Japanese, and so they have some different leaf shapes to them mm -hmm. and are quite unique. Um, but if they produce a little winged fruit, you can pretty well identify Tip, them as a maple. Tips you off to the maples, yeah. So, um, well, thanks, Dave, for yep. sharing some of that information about maples, and um, I think we're probably in some other tree talks, we might be talking a little bit about that kind of um, how maples compete with oaks a little bit in yeah. the forest, which I think is a, is an important story to tell. But but appreciate you brought up that maples have, you know, on the north or east facing slopes and wetter areas, like that's, that's a place yeah. we want to see those maples. So. And uh, we'll have a, additional segments in the future on tree talk where we'll focus in on a group of trees. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, and today we're going to do a little quick segment on A Day in the Woods, the program, um, which is really appropriate for our landowners and enthusiasts. And anyway, Dave's going to tell us some about that, and um, yeah, we'll fill you in on that program. So A Day in the Woods is a program that started uh, in 2012, so we're going on our eighth year with Day in the Woods, and we're, we're so excited about it. And if you'll notice, this is a, basically an image, the, the front cover of our brochure, and then also uh, the back image that shows all of the partners. And what's really unique and what makes Day in the Woods work is the partnership. Um, the program is really was designed to highlight the Vinton Furnace State Forest, which has been an experimental forest since 1952. There's been lots of neat work that's taken place at the Vinton Furnace State Forest, and the Forest Service has taken the lead on that work, but it's now a state forest. It's our newest state forest, and Division of Forestry owns and manages it. So we've pulled together all these partners that do different things, either support us financially, help with programming, help with printing and we put a program together for woodland owners mainly <clears throat> and we focus on southern Ohio and Appalachian Ohio and we have a variety of topics that we cover. We program from May through November each season and so far we've done over 60 programs and we average about um, 40 people per program so we're real excited about a day in the woods. And those, um, so Dave, those programs it tends mm -hmm. to be on the second Friday is usually yes. what you target. Sometimes you have some kind of bonus yeah we've added days. a few um and it's um just to kind of recap for people so it's near macarthur ohio it is so it tends to um so basically a southeast ohio focus and draw but anyone is welcome that is correct um most of the folks do come from venton athens jackson and the surrounding counties um <clears throat> but we mainly program at the venton furnace occasionally and this year we're going out to a couple other state forests this year too okay so and i guess one thing i would share as you know, somebody who's newer to Ohio, um, I've just been really impressed with the, the, the partnership really is amazing. I mean, it's, um, so you go to one of these events and you, on any given day, you, you easily could have, um, 10 to 20 natural resource professionals from a variety of backgrounds. Um, so there's a lot of actually professional development for each of us interacting with one another. But I also think what's really strong about that is if you're attending as a landowner, You've got, most likely any given day, you've got an extension person, a division of forestry person, right. a division of wildlife, a soil and water to kind of mesh together and fill in the gaps. Um, yep. Yeah, which is awesome. So Day in the Woods, all the information about Day in the Woods is here at this webpage, u.osu.edu, Southeast Ohio Woods. And what we do is we'll do a little post on each program. Um, the, the one that's coming up tomorrow is on edible plants. These programs 
programs run from about 9 a.m. to about 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, the registration fee we try to keep low. With all those partners, we're able to keep it to $12, and it includes a nice catered lunch. So go to this webpage. You can get a brochure. You can get the information about the programs. And there's a registration deadline the Monday prior to the Friday that's coming up. And we'll give you a little overview of the schedule for this coming year. I've already mentioned the spring edible program, which will probably be over by the time this airs. But later in the month, we have a second program on May 24th at Hawking College, focusing in on tree identification. What's cool about Hawking College, we can break into small groups. We can, based on your level of expertise and experience, we can put you with the right group to make it the best and, and most productive day for you. We've got one coming up in June at the Venton Furnace on non-game wildlife. We've got mainly wildlife biologists from the Division of Wildlife and also from um, OSU helping with that program. We're going to do one focusing in on things. Um, if you're a woodland owner, what programs, what resources are available to help? This ties in with the oak efforts that we're doing, but we want to help landowners get connected and find out ways they can improve their woods. Okay, so that one really ties in with that interagency forestry team that we hear about sometimes. It does. Yeah. It does very well. And we're also looking at maybe doing some follow-up on-site programming at different you know, local people's woods as well. And then our next one we're real excited about, it's in the Hocking Hills at Hocking State Forest. We're going to focus in on the Hemlock ecosystem. And we've got a special guest coming in to do some night sounds. It's going to be educational and entertaining. We're going to finish up with a few other programs like timber harvesting. A day focusing on what's a timber harvest like? What do you, how would you go about it if you wanted to do it? And we're actually going to see harvesting take place. And maybe I can jump in yep. on this one, Dave. Um, our family day in the woods. So this is actually just the second uh, second time that we're offering this, uh, but we hope to continue it. Uh, and basically, we really want youth and the whole family to come on out. Uh, we have some fun fun things happening. Uh, last year we had some rattlesnakes, a sawmill. Uh, got to check out the iron furnaces and uh, just all kinds of things. So bring the whole family out. Yeah, and that's on Saturday, September fourteenth, at the Venton Furnace State Forest. And it's free that one that one is yeah. free and then we end up with a couple other programs on woodland wildlife research and winter tree identification so day in the woods great opportunity to learn about um, some of the programs and you know what's going on in your woods and if you come to the tree id one at hawking college you're going to have the opportunity to get a couple of our publications that are part of the program so. all right hope to see some of you there bring a landowner friend thanks